everyone, Russ of Aquarimax Pets here. I'm here with my guest for the evening, Lori Torini, and uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm happy to be here. We're happy to have you. I've been excited about this episode. It's been in the works for a while now, and uh, we've already got a lot of people that are interested in watching. We've got Frank the Tank, Aunt Sandy Skinks, Rochelle Workman, Jotaro925, Laura Taylor, Wolfgeist, uh, and so far. So excellent. And uh, Lori, could you introduce yourself a little bit? Give us some of your background and how you got to where you are where you are now as a trainer and behaviorist. Sure. My name is Lori Torini. I currently am the director of Spirit Keeper Animal Sanctuary, which is a 501c3 nonprofit animal sanctuary that takes in special needs and at-risk animals in Colorado. And then I own my own behavior and training business that is called Behavior Education LLC. And I started animal training over 30 years ago. So mm -hmm. I was an animal trainer first and a behaviorist later. So I trained dogs and horses mainly for most of my life. And then about six years ago, I started getting into behavior science. And that has just made my animal training so much more effective and efficient. I've learned so much through behavior science. Um, things make so much more sense to me. Um, the laws of learning and how learning works makes so much more sense to me after studying behavior science. And then most recently, um, thanks to Dr. Christina Spalding of um, Science Matters Academy of Animal Behavior, who is a neuropsychologist, I've been studying neuroscience in the sense of how that relates to animal behavior and training. So I've been specifically working with snakes for about how many years now? Since 2018, so five years. Um, I worked for the city of Colorado Springs as a police officer for 21 years. And when I was getting close to retiring from that job and I had been animal training on the side that entire time, I went back to school and got my degree in zookeeping because I knew in, in my retirement, I wanted to embark on a career that I loved. And that was a career with animals. So I finished my degree in zookeeping actually before I retired from the police department and then started um, a second degree in animal health and behavior. And hopefully in January, I'm starting a master's in applied animal behavior. So that's where I'm at right now. I started working with snakes in 2018, um, but I had snakes before that as pets. And um, I really, I took her pathology in 2017 and, and decided that um, I wanted to go that route with some of my animal work. And then I took in a snake that um, had some behavioral issues and some issues adjusting and some fear issues. And I thought to myself, well, if this was a dog or a horse, how would I manage this? And so I used the same principles and the same concepts and very quickly her issues were resolved and we developed a way to communicate with each other. And it's very easy to care for her now. And she's not a stressed or fearful animal anymore. That's excellent. It's, uh, we were talking a little bit before the stream started about this this idea of being able to generalize the uh, laws of learning and the principles behind behavior science to reptiles that doesn't come naturally to everyone but that's exactly what you did and that started you on this path it did and i'm surprised at how easily it is to teach them not only classical conditioning but operant conditioning um some days I would much rather work with some of my snakes than my dogs or horses because I feel like it's so much easier for us to communicate and, and they learn so well. That, that's, that is great to hear. So that uh, kind of segues into uh, our friend here uh, that you have brought. Can you introduce us to the snake that you have with, yes. with you? This is Telemachus. He is a Morelia Bredley or a Bredles python. They're also called Centralian pythons, and they're a sister taxa to carpet pythons. So he's a Morelia Bredley. Carpet pythons are Morelia spilota. So they're um, from Australia, and they're endemic to a very specific area around Alice Springs in um, northern Australia, but just in northern Australia. It's right in the center part of Australia, and they're from a pretty harsh environment that is dry a lot of the time can get 100 degrees fahrenheit during the day and then drop to 40 or 50 or sometimes freezing at night mm -hmm. um colorado can be like that and that's <laughs> where i live my brettles pythons do really well here in colorado like mm -hmm. i don't have to do too much special anything special really with their environment or parameters 
here in Colorado, which is really nice because I'm able to have them out a lot. Some of them are on, are in open air enclosures. Um, and I have a couple that basically live in my office space and, and I don't contain them anymore. Cause you don't need to. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, uh, heard you talking about that on your, your channel. And, uh, I think it's really cool that they can get to the point where that that's an, an option. Love and that. for these two that do it, and Telemachus isn't one of them. He's just happened to be who was awake and mm -hmm. um, came out when I opened the door when, when I was getting ready. The two that are out, that was not overnight. You know, right. that was over about a four year process of training and, and um, cooperative care work and relationship and trust building and getting them acclimated to my workspace so that it is safe for, and snake proofing the space so that it is okay for them to free roam. Right. It's not, I, I, I love how you highlight that. This is not something you can just say, oh, I'm going to start doing this now. No. You have to, uh, it takes preparation. It takes time, it takes training. Anytime you transition a snake or any animal from what they've always known to something new, it needs to be gradual because acute or abrupt sudden changes are scary for everyone. And you're gonna have that those outliers that thrive on that, but most of the time it's super scary. And so any transitions that you're making from the way that an animal is being kept, you wanna make gradually. Right. I notice on your channel, you have videos where you take a, a snake, a newly acquired snake, and it's in a bin like the bin it was raised in, and you put that into a larger enclosure yes. so that it can slowly transition um, into this larger enclosure. And that works so well if you're able to do that because then it's the snake's choice then they have the choice and control of when they're ready to leave that tub and explore the, the larger habitat. You know, if they want to stay in that tub for days or weeks or months, and that's where they feel secure, then they can make the decision when they're ready to leave and explore what's outside. Right. So you, the ball is in their court. Correct. And that reduces the stress. That makes sense. All right. So um, in addition to uh, the, the, the bread lie that you have um, with you right now, what are some other snake species you work with and why have you chosen to work with those snake species? Well, I'll start with Bradley because they're my absolute favorite. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Their personality and temperament just meshes absolutely perfectly with mine. I'm able to interact with them in ways that I enjoy and that doesn't stress them. And it's not usually handling. It is very unusual for me to handle a snake even this much because I enjoy watching them choose what they want to do and um, just deciding their own behavioral outcomes. And I just enjoy seeing the things that they choose to do. And Morelia Bradley are visible most of the time. They seldom hide. They're, they're a fairly active snake without being darty and flighty. So mm -hmm. they move around this room in a manner that's easy for me to watch and they stay out in the open and they're not bothered by me working and moving around. Um, they do their own thing. I do my own thing and I get to see them and observe them. And I love that. Um, you know, he is a seven year old male. Males stay smaller than females. He's about he's not quite six feet. Um, my biggest snakes are just over six feet, but I have a couple of females. I'm sure will get bigger than that. Uh, but I just love them. And uh, I have quite a few. I have more Morelia Bradley than any other snake. I have 35 of them. I've worked with more, but unfortunately I've lost a couple to cancer. Huh. So if I wasn't doing this as a profession and I just had the snakes as family members, it would be this species for sure. Yeah. I do have other species. I also really like carpet pythons and I have about 25 uh, Morelia spilota of different subspecies. And I would say they're my second favorite snake. Um, some of the species that I keep are because I do private coaching and I do group classes in snake training and behavior. And the most popular pet snakes worldwide, according to research, are corn snakes and royal pythons, ball pythons. And so many, many, many of my clients have uh, python regis and corn snakes. And so I have those species here and I work with them extensively so that I am better informed to help my clients when they run into issues with them, or if they want to teach those snakes a behavior, then I'm able to work through that here. And then I'm able to coach them. So I have several Royal Pythons and several corn snakes. Um, I also have one Central American boa, four rainbow boas, 
uh, a couple of king snakes, a false water cobra. And that snake was sent to me by West Liberty University when I coached a grad student for her thesis. Her thesis was snake training, and she wanted to cooperatively train the snakes, the false water cobras specifically, to shift out of their primary habitat into a temporary holding and shift back. And she successfully did that. And she successfully also taught them to shift onto a scale to be weighed cooperatively, which means the snakes are voluntarily choosing to do that when cued. And so they sent me a false water cobra to work with here so that I was better able to coach her there. And I'm really glad they did because that's not a typical snake species at right. all. <laughs> and that paper actually got published. I'm a co-author on that paper. So she did a great job. Um, her name is Michelle Williams and her PhD professor was Dr. Zach Lofman. And I'm really proud of the work that we did with that. Um, I also have a bull snake and a gopher snake, an Escalapian snake, a Korean rat snake, an Angolan python, and I think that's it. So I have some snakes just in ones or twos because of projects I've been involved in, and I really needed to have hands on one of the snakes to get a feel for their behavior and temperament. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have a question from the from 503 Menagerie I'll put on the screen there. For those of you just listening, she says, bald pythons are notoriously bad about going off food. Have you been able to address that with training? Can we talk about that a bit? Sure. So I observe almost 30 bald pythons here, and I don't worry about them eating because what I've determined, I specifically watched two for two years and fed them solely based on behavior. And what I found with them, and those were also two that I was very hands off with, they were, they were two that I was just observing behavior. So I set them up and left them alone and just made behavioral observations. And I noticed that there are times of the year when they eat quite frequently. Like I have fed them two or three days in a row. I fed them once a week and then they'll decide, okay, I'm good. And they won't eat for six weeks or a couple of months. And I would venture to guess, now I don't study them in the field in situ, I study them here under captive management, that that's probably part of their natural biology is to store up on food a lot during certain times of the year or maybe certain times of their life stages and then, then rest for a while and they don't need food. So that's how I feed those two and they're doing just fine with that. I work super closely with my exotics veterinarian, Dr. Liza Pfaff at Critter Care Animal Hospital in Centennial, Colorado. And they're in great shape, great body condition. So I let those two choose. They tell me when they need to eat and, and when they don't. Now, as far as snakes that you're transitioning or you just get, or you think that stress has caused them to go off food, that can happen. But I think sometimes people mistake my snake must be stressed and not eating for it just doesn't need to eat right now. Mm -hmm. And they can go a really long time without eating, especially Royal pythons, and they can maintain their body weight for months without eating and not lose any weight. But if your snake has gone off food or has had behavior changes due to stress, then you need to look at what preceded that was, what was the antecedent that preceded that happening? Was there some stressor? Was there a stressful event? Or are the conditions just stressful enough that the, the snake has been chronically stressed and now it can't cope anymore? So those are all things to look at. Um, because think about when you're stressed. Some of us eat a ton when we're stressed, like we just <laughs> stuff our face with food. And other people have no appetite and they don't want to eat at all. And so if you think the snake's not eating due to stress, then you need to look at what's the source of this stress. And everyone right away wants to look at climate, temperature, humidity, um, environmental parameters. And of course you wanna look at that, but there are many other things that can stress a snake, many other things, like not having enough furnishings in the enclosure to make them feel safe and make them feel like they have options, not making them feel like they have agency and choice and control over their own behavioral outcomes. And um, if they're unable to perform innate behaviors that they have natural urges to do, then you might start seeing maladaptive behavior or stereotypies occur, one of which can be going off food and withdrawing, hiding a lot, being apathetic. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the snake may become hyperactive, um, more reactive to movement outside of the enclosure. They may glass surf, they may nose push. You know, you might see other unusual behavior. Okay, no, that makes a lot of sense. 
Okay, we've got another question from Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, also fans of the Morelia genus. Um, thanks for the super chat. And they wanted to ask you, um, how would you suggest an impatient person approach target training? Okay, so how quickly target training goes depends on the species of snake you're working with. So if you have a python species that isn't eating very often or a boa species that's not eating very often, maybe they eat every couple of weeks, maybe they eat once a month, um, they're going to learn just fine. Absolutely in the wild, if a snake finds a meal someplace and is successful in acquiring that meal and then they don't eat again for a month, they're going to remember how they acquired that last time, where they acquired it, and they're going to go back to that spot and try again. So from a training perspective, the latency period between sessions is not a problem. Your snake is going to learn. If you're impatient and you're like, I want to train my snake every day, you can do one of two things. You can work with a species that you can safely feed more frequently. Some of the colubrids or like the Korean rat snake, Russian rat snake, false water cobra, they can eat up to two times a week or once a week or just more frequently. I don't feed mine that often, but they can. Or um, you can use something else as a reinforcer besides food, but you just have to figure out what is reinforcing for your snake. And reinforcers are those things that we would view as rewards. So when you go to work, you go to your job, you do that because you get a paycheck. And so that's your reinforcer. And most people wouldn't go to work if they didn't get that paycheck. You know, so you need to find what's reinforcing for your snake. For Morelia Bradley and some of my other snakes, but uh, the retic, I forgot to say I have two super dwarf retics. Freedom is very reinforcing for them. And freedom for most organisms is a primary reinforcer. So if you have a snake that's like, I want out, I want out, I want out, and you open the door and they come right out, you can pair opening the door with a target and you can use that desire for freedom to train them to do a behavior. So for example, I've done this with TC, my super door free tick. He wants out and I let him out quite frequently. But if I pair opening the door with a specific target, he learns that even when he doesn't want out, if he sees that target, that it's an opportunity to come out. And then I put a scale or something on the outside of his enclosure. And if he stations on that scale for a few seconds first, before he goes out and roams, um, then I get to weigh him and he gets to come out and roam. So you can use non-food reinforcers, but it's a little more tricky because you have to still pair that with a target and a different target than you're pairing with food. And then you need to figure out what your snake finds reinforcing. Right. And, and we tend to gravitate towards food as the easiest primary reinforcer to find. It is. And I usually start with that with all my snakes. But once they kind of catch on to the target training, then sometimes I'll teach them other things. And I just use a different target and say, OK, this target means you can earn food. This target means you can earn time out of your enclosure. Um, also understand that there's two ways to use a target. Um, one way is just as a signal that you're going to eat. And I do recommend that at the very least that you teach your snakes a word or a, basically you're teaching them. Um, what dinner time means. So if I ring a dinner bell and call you into dinner, or if I call outside, hey, Russ, it's time to come in and eat, I'm communicating to you that it's time to eat. So you can pair a target with food using classical conditioning. And every time the snake sees the target, it knows it's going to eat. And that really clears up a lot of miscommunication around food. The other way you can use a target is that you can teach the snake interacting with that target or following that target is an opportunity to earn reinforcement. So it doesn't mean that you're automatically gonna get food, but it communicates to you that, hey, if you follow this target here, then you will get reinforced with food and that's operant conditioning. Right, because it, it involves a, a choice on the part of the, the snake to participate in a behavior or not. Right. One is a goal-directed behavior on the snake's part, and the other one is just um, can become habit or is just a reflex behavior. Oh, I smell food. I know I can go in and mom's cooking dinner. Or, oh, I see the target. I know I'm going to eat. Right. Where it's just basically the stimulus changes. Right. But it's not, not changing behavior per se. It's changing. The one stimulus. is classical conditioning. A means B is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, just regardless of the behavior, it doesn't matter what the snake does. If it sees the target, it's still getting the food. 
And the other one is operant conditioning, which means um, you have to actually perform a behavior or do something in order to earn the reinforcement. Right. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, I think that is a good uh, lead in to some of the misconceptions about reptile behaviors, particularly the cognitive ones. Can we talk about some of the misconceptions about reptile cognition? Oh, it looks like uh, we froze okay. up for a second. Yeah, we did, but I can hear you again now. Okay, yeah, I think, it, I think we're all back. So cognitive misconceptions, the, first of all, what I hear all the time is that all snake behavior is just instinctual, that they can't learn, they can't be trained, that everything they do is just instinct. And quite frankly, that's ridiculous from many perspectives. If you look at snakes in the wild, if they were living and surviving purely on instinct, they wouldn't be surviving very long because they have to have the ability to learn from experiences in the wild. So here's an example. If a snake, maybe a new hatchling, it doesn't know anything about the world, it's cruising along a field and a bird swoops down and it's like, oh, there's something swooping down above my head and it just sits there and takes no action and the bird picks it up, maybe bites it, hurts it with its claws, you know, somehow the snake gets away. It has learned that 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 is the outcome of just sitting there when the bird swoops over them is aversive, is negative. And so the next time that happens, if the snake has learned, had the ability to learn, then when they see the bird uh, swoop down, they're going to take off. They're going to hide. They're going to retreat. They're going to go somewhere to avoid that. And they're going to realize, oh, I left when that bird came near and I'm okay. Nothing happened. So that's what I'm going to do from now on. That is what learning is. There's an antecedent, some type of stimulus in the environment. There's a behavior on the snake's part or your part or, or another animal's part. And then there's a consequence. And if that consequence is bad, that behavior that preceded it is not going to be repeated. And if that consequence is good, the behavior that preceded it, it is going to be repeated. And that's what learning is in a, very simply put. And it's why we're able to train the snakes and other animals under captive management, because they have this ability to learn in nature. They have to, or they wouldn't survive. And so we can take that same ability to learn and that same ABCs, the antecedent, the behavior and the consequence, and we can teach them things under captive management. And we've seen that we can teach them things. I have hundreds of, of videos showing how the snakes have learned things. There have been a few published papers about snakes being operantly conditioned to do things like wild Burmese pythons being operantly conditioned to push a button, but only when it's lighted up in order to open a door and access food. That's a goal directed behavior. And the snake had to learn that that's not instinct. Right. So that's one of the misconceptions. The other misconception is that snakes have a primitive brain that's nothing like ours. And so they, they just physically can't learn and participate in higher functioning. And that's also ridiculous. That was just a misnomer started in the 1950s. It was very quickly debunked by science, but for some reason it took hold and it stayed in popular culture. And so the brain of the snake has the same or similar structures as all vertebrates. Those are animals that have a spinal cord, a brain, a nervous system. They produce the same or similar neurochemicals and the same or similar hormones. And while, of course, every organism's brain is not identical, the functions of different structures in the brain do similar things. So while the snake's brain might not be identical in structure to ours, it has the amygdala, it has the hippocampus, it has a thalamus, it has a cortex, it has all three brain regions, you know, um, the midbrain, the hindbrain, the forebrain. They're not structured identically to ours, but they have all those re regions and they can absolutely do complex behaviors and learn complex things. So if you think of an airplane versus a helicopter, neither of those two aircraft achieve lift in the same, they achieve lift the same way because the principle of lift is the principle of lift, but they don't do it using the same structures. An airplane uses its wings to achieve lift and a helicopter uses rotors 
And so those two things are very different looking and very different structures, but they both fly. And that's how I really want you to think about the snake's brain versus the frog's brain versus the turtles versus the humans versus the dogs. They're not all going to look identical, but they're all going to ultimately do the same things. I really like that analogy. It's, it's a very clear way to think about it because they all have the same uh, they, they need to interact with their environment. They have that that basic similarity and they often do it in very similar ways, but they're achieving it from from different directions. I love that. And also when we think of structures, we think macro, like we're thinking structures we can see. But when you look at the actual cells in the brain, like the cells in part of the snake's brain, um, the dorsal ventricular ridge and the bird's brain, that's what what researchers think may be homologous to the mammalian neocortex, those cells are the same. So even though those are two different structures, they're made up of the same structure, the same type of cell. And so are likely performing the same ultimate functions. That makes a lot of sense as well. That's a great insight. We have another question that's related to this idea. So um, Razor Clan wanted to know if you've noticed anything about reptiles and preferences for certain humans. So if you notice that your reptile or your snake or other reptile seems to prefer to be around you, there are a few reasons why that might be. First of all, if your snakes had aversive experiences with, with other people and good experiences with you, then of course it's going to prefer to be with you. If it finds your presence safe and secure and reinforcing, nothing bad's ever happened to it around you, but it's unsure about these other people, or even maybe other people have done something to it that it finds unpleasant, it's going to prefer you. And then on the other hand, snakes and most animals like familiarity. Now there is a place for novelty, but most of the time in, in an animal's daily life, they like predictability and they like to feel safe. And so if your smell, if your scent, if your texture, if everything about you is what's familiar and what is known and they've always been safe with you, they are going to gravitate towards you versus somebody that's unknown that their smell is different and they're just not sure about. That makes sense. That's a great way to explain it because uh, I've, I feel like I've made the observation that these preferences tend to exist, but I've never heard it articulated in such a, a clear way. So that that makes sense. But it was my wife, first of all, who brought it up to me, and she said, "Your snakes, when you are when you're handling your snakes, and other people are handling your snakes, the snakes seem to try to gravitate back to you." And I, I said, "Oh, I hadn't noticed that." But then when she said it, I did notice that, and uh, so thank you for explaining that. That's that helps me understand why. I mean, you're a known quantity and these other people are unknown and unknown is usually scary. <laughs> right. And and I've uh, since then, I've tried to do uh, more, give the snakes opportunities to interact with those people in non-scary ways. And mm -hmm. I think it's changing now. So that they're just more likely to be um, interested in interacting with, with everyone. Yes, they can habituate to, to learning to interact with more people as long as they don't have a bad experience in that process. Right. Makes a lot of sense. So there are some of the uh, some of the misconceptions about cognition in snakes. Um, now, can you tell us how that relates to reptile emotions and, and uh, misconceptions people have about reptile emotions? Yes, there is a huge misconception, first off, that reptiles don't have emotions. Reptiles don't have emotions. All right. Every vertebrate has emotions. And so right now I need to make sure we define emotions versus feelings. Emotions are physiological responses to environmental stimuli. Something happens, we're scared. Something happens, uh, we're anxious, we're nervous. Um, so those are, are literally things that happen to us physiologically. Our hormone levels change, our neurochemicals changed, and that's what causes emotions and emotions drive behavior. All behavior is driven by emotions or we would not behave. So emotions are those things that are like pleasure, displeasure, fear, um, seeking, like the anticipation of seeking things out and finding something that is reinforcing and you get excited about that. Those are emotions because they're physiological responses that we have. All vertebrates have them. 
And the neurochemicals and hormones that produce those emotions, snakes have two, either the exact same ones or similar ones. So we have oxytocin, uh, snakes and fish have mesotocin. So um, there's dopamine in the snake's brain, uh, corticosterone is a stress hormone that snakes have. So snakes have emotions, all vertebrates do. Feelings are the labels we put on those emotions. Oh, I feel so bummed out. Oh, I feel sad. Oh, I love you. I mean, we can't know if snakes have labels for the way that they're feeling. I don't know if animals can label things in their mind when they don't have a language. So feelings are those labels that we use to describe our emotions. And there's hundreds of them, right? And what means love to me might mean something different to you. When I say I'm sad, you might mean something different. Like sad for me might be, oh, yeah, I'm sad. And sad for you might be, I'm so like depressed that I, I just can't go on today. So we describe things with these labels and those are what feelings are. And we're not going to get into that with reptiles or other animals because there's no way to know that those are subjective but we can know that they have emotions because they have emotional responses to environmental stimuli. So if they find something fear, scary or aversive, they retreat or they hide or they get defensive. If they find something they like, they move towards it. If they find something they dislike, they stay away from it. Mm -hmm. So it can be uh, measured objectively that they have emotions and feelings are just the, the labels that we put on the ones that we as humans experience. Correct. No, makes a lot of sense. So uh, with these ideas that, that snakes can have preferences, emotions, and that they do have higher cognition, uh, let's talk a little bit about enrichment. Um, I know there are various types of enrichment, and there's a lot of controversy when we're talking about snakes and other reptiles with regard to enrichment, whether or not they need it, and what, what kinds are good for them. Can we talk a little bit about that? Sure. So enrichment is a experience or a one-time object that you place with the animal to interact with. Either you remove them from their habitat and you give them an enrichment experience and activity, or you place an object in their habitat that they can interact with that's novel and it's not permanent. You know, these enrichment experiences or enrichment objects are temporary. they are things to like, like you go to the circus one day, you go to the fair, you go to a movie. That's not something you're doing constantly or is always there. It's something you do every now and then to have a new experience, a novel experience. An enriched environment is something that's permanent. So that's an environment that is very stimulating and has permanent furnishings in it to allow the snake or other animal to execute behavioral choices within their confined space. So instead of just having a warm hide, cool hide and a water dish where the snake is like, well, I can sit in this warm hide. OK, I can go get cool. OK, I guess I can drink. Now the enclosure is filled up with sky hides, hides at a medium level, maybe hides under the soil, maybe branches, maybe a swimming area, just all kinds of things. So now the snake has all these choices. Oh, I could go rest on this ledge today or I could rest in my hide or I could rest in this elevated hide, or I could climb up onto that branch and rest, or I could burrow into the soil and rest. And so they just have the perception of more control that way. And that's called agency. So control is the physical ab ability to control what's happening in your environment. Agency is perceived control. And lots and lots of studies have showed that biological organisms have an innate need for agency, the perception of control. And when you perceive you don't have control over what's happening to you, it can cause maladaptive behavior, stress behaviors, depression-like behaviors. And I say depression-like because we can't know if animals experience some of these same things as humans, but we can say we are observing depression-like behavior in this animal or anxiety-like behavior in this animal. Because they're observable behaviors and behavior sets that are similar to what a human would exhibit in a similar situation. Correct. That makes yeah. sense. So as to where whether snakes need enrichment, I would say observe your animal. And if your animal is displaying maladaptive behaviors, abnormal behaviors, excessive 
stereotypies, it needs something where it wouldn't be performing those behaviors. And I will also say, if you aren't watching your animal 24 seven, you don't know if it's doing that. Right. So if you have a nocturnal snake, which royal pythons are, I know that I observe mine in the middle of the night. So if you are keeping your royal python a certain way and you think it's fine because you tell me all day, it's just hiding. It never comes out. It hides all the time. I will ask, what's it doing at midnight? What's it doing at 2 a.m.? Oh, I don't know. Because at midnight, 2 a.m., it might be glass surfing, nose pushing. It might be hyperactive. It might be doing all sorts of things you're unaware that it's doing. And if it's performing those behaviors, then it needs something because the reason it does that is that it has innate urges that it's unable to perform due to the confined space you have it in. Right. And so, so enrichment and enriching environments and enrichment experiences are ways that we can try to give the animals an outlet to express some of these innate behaviors, these natural behaviors that they're unable to perform in a cage or under captive management and, and allow them to get that out of their system. And then when they go back to their habitat, they rest, you know, they're content, they're quiet. Yeah. Makes sense. I know that uh, in response to your videos, I added a sky hide to our corn snakes enclosure. And at first I didn't really seem to interact with it a lot, but uh, eventually it came to really, really, make the choice to go to the sky hide quite a bit and it does that and i started out by leaving scent trails with food to introduce it to the, mm -hmm. the sky hide and would go in there just when it was following those scent trails after the food but after a while it decided no this is a place that's going to spend time and so i did that and as far as out of the enclosure enrichment i noticed that early on the the snake was sometimes uncomfortable with new environments mm -hmm. and would, would attempt to hide but now when I put it out, it's it's very much more interested in exploring because it feels comfortable, it's habituated, and it is it's uh hap well, I can't say happy exactly, but it it uh it uh chooses to explore. Correct. So when you're introducing enrichment or an enrichment experience, or when you're just changing the enclosure to make it more environmentally complex, remember that change can be stressful. So I don't recommend that you change it all at once. Gradual changes are best. And some animals, some snakes are just innately neophilic, which means they're attracted to novelty. They're very curious. I had somebody the other day say, well, I don't understand this target training. My snake follows anything that I move in front of it, the remote control or, or my cup, or it follows anything. Well, that's, that's a curiosity response to a novel object. It's like, what is that? It doesn't actually know that that means anything. So some snakes are going to be like that and other snakes are going to be, oh my God, that's so scary. I don't want to have anything to do with it. It might take them days or weeks to get up the courage to interact with that. But once they do, they decide, hey, I kind of like this and I want to interact with this more, which is why when you make those changes, you need to give it time. I mean, unless the snake has such an adverse reaction to something that they're exhibiting escape and avoidance behavior and like, El having cloacal eliminations and just like having a big fear response, then you leave it in there, make sure it doesn't interfere with getting to resources and allow them time to acclimate to it and get used to it. And I also want to mention, because you mentioned hides, um, and there's a paper that came out recently on the cognitive control of escape behavior. And it's very interesting because just the presence of a hide, even if the animal wasn't using it, changed their behavior when predators were nearby. So if you have a hide and you put it hides in there and say, well, I I don't know why I give my snake hides. It's never hides. You know, it doesn't use them. It may be psychologically using those hides because knowing that that hide is available, maybe making it very calm and relaxed and feel safe because it knows it can go in there if it needs to, even though it's choosing not to most of the time. And I really feel like animal keepers, reptile keepers in particular, aren't thinking about that kind of stuff. And that does make a lot of sense. I learned about that principle first with fish. Many mm -hmm. times if you have shy fish and you provide a lot of uh, decor, plants, whatever that they can hide in, they'll spend more of their time in the open because they know they have the option yes. to hide. And if they just have one little place that they can hide, they might hang out all the time there in that one little spot because it's their only option. Yes. So they're using the hide psychologically 
even when they're physically not using it. And we really need to understand that sometimes there are psychological uses for things that we provide our snakes and other animals that we may not be perceiving, but mean something to the snake. Yeah, I, I love that phrase. Um, they're using it psychologically. That's a, a great way to help wrap our minds around what they're doing and, and why it's important to have it there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can we talk about some of the misconceptions regarding handling? So I think there are a lot of them. <laughs> yes, there are. So when we're talking about snakes, so first let's say dogs, let's, most people have dogs. A lot of people have dogs. Dogs are a species, even wild canids, with the exception of a few species like Maine wolves, are very social. Like their whole dog societies and family groups are social. So their interaction a lot is physical. They touch each other. They mouth each other. It's a lot of physical activity. And so for us to bring them into our homes and interact with them, the touching is innate to them. Okay. Snakes are not inherently social with other snakes, and they're certainly not inherently social with other animals. So if another animal is touching a snake, it's either because the snake is eating it or trying to acquire it for food or because something is trying to eat the snake. And so being touched is really scary for a snake. It's not part of their natural behavioral repertoire. We know there are a few social species like rattlesnakes and garter snakes that do live communally. And they interact with each other in these family groups and they, they have physical contact with each other. Most snakes are not like that. And they have to become habituated to touch and handling slowly so that they are not afraid of you and they don't view you as something aversive. And one of the hugest misconceptions that I hear is just pick the snake up and hold it until it settles down. Or if the snake's trying to get away from you, just reach in there and grab it out anyway because it has to learn it can't run from you. And what it's actually learning is that you're scary and you're not respecting what it's trying to communicate to you and that you are something to be frightened of and you're a threat. And when you hold a snake that's struggling or trying to get away until they're no longer doing that, it's either because they've become exhausted or now they've entered a state of learned helplessness, which is where they learn that their behavior doesn't matter. Nothing they do matters. And they just withdraw and become apathetic and lethargic. And they're just going to sit there and tolerate it until it's over because they've learned that nothing they do matters. And generally, the next time you go to interact with them, they're going to try harder to hide or to get away because they remember that horrible experience they had with you the last time. And that's called flooding. When you subject an animal, a human or other animal, to an aversive stimulus, something they're afraid of, and they have no ability to get away from it, to choose to leave, that's called flooding. And it is not considered ethical in animal behavior or animal training. It is absolutely prohibited by the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, of an organization that I've written articles for and um, recently published a snake enrichment webinar for and am a member of. So you can't use flooding in animal behavior modification or animal training. It's just not reputable. There are human treatments that are flooding, like um, immersion therapy. So if you are, let's say you're afraid of spiders and you decide, you know what? I need to get over this. Just put me in a room with spiders and I'm going to just tolerate it until I'm not afraid. That's what flooding is. But you're consenting to that. And you know what's going to happen. An animal cannot consent to that, and they have no idea what's happening. And it's right. why it's considered unethical in animal behavior and animal training. So the best way to establish a good relationship with your snake is through gradual desensitization, um, passive and active habituation, and time. Letting them know that you're not scary, that you're not a threat. You're not going to force yourself on them, and you're not going to hurt them. And there are lots and lots of ways to do that. I have playlists about gradual desensitization and habituating them to touch and handling. Um, then like passive habituation is setting the snake up in an area and giving them at least one window that they can see out of so they can see everything that's going on and all the activity. And they can retreat from that if it's too much, but they can see what's happening and learn, okay, all this stuff is normal in this home and it's not scary because nothing ever happens to me. Active habituation is doing things like target training or station training 
or putting like an exercise tent adjacent to the enclosure and letting them shift in and out on their own when they want to. So you're actively doing something to try to boost the snake's confidence, but you're not flooding them. And they always need to have the option to get away. Always, even when you introduce a novel object or introduce training or introduce anything new, they need to have that ability to get away. And if they don't, that becomes a problem. That that becomes flooding or that becomes stress. Um, they need to have the option to get away. Yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense. There's uh, That's what I was thinking right before you said flooding, that I guess if they don't have the opportunity to escape from it, it could very well become that. So, right. yeah. I like that explanation. So um, if uh, relating to this too, uh, you mentioned in, in the notes we had that you had put together prior, you were mentioning about people often use hooks um, oh, yeah. with the idea that they're touching the snake with a hook. And that is a signal that snakes are not going to be fed in that particular instance. Can you tell us more about that as a I, misconception? I can. It drives me nuts when I hear that. You're touching the snake with a hook or another object. It could be anything. You could be touching them with a fly swatter or a paper towel roll, or it doesn't matter what the thing is. You're touching the snake, but let's just say with the hook. And then something happens. That thing that happens next is what the snake is going to associate the meaning of that touch with. Not all the hundreds of things that didn't happen. The snake's not going to be thinking, he, I got touched on the head with this hook. And I didn't get fed. I didn't get a drink of water. I didn't get let out. The sun didn't set. Uh, the temperature didn't change. I mean, hundreds of things could have not happened. So how's the snake to know that being touched with the hook means, oh, the one thing that's not going to happen is I'm not going to get fed. That's crazy. <laughs> So this, this is classical conditioning. The snake is going to associate the touch on the head with what follows. So if that is you sticking your hands in the enclosure to spot clean, to change water, to change furnishings, the snake is going to learn when I get touched on the head with this hook, it means that this thing is going to invade my enclosure and do stuff. It means that they're going to stick part of their body or these hands are going to come in my enclosure and stuff's going to happen. Or if you're touching the snake with a hook and then you're picking it up and taking it out, the snake is going to learn, oh, this means that they are going to pick me up and touch me and take me out. That is what anything that happens right after the touching with the hook is what the snake learns that hook means. Not all the things that don't happen. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's with anything. So you can use so many things to communicate things and ideas to your snake. You just have to pair that thing with a behavior. So they can learn this target means the door is going to open. This target means I'm going to get fed. The hook means I'm going to get picked up. Um, this light flashing means that my water is going to get changed. I mean, you can get as complex with it as you want, but you have to pair one signal or word with one behavior. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I like that. That's, that's uh, a much clearer way to put it than uh, I think a lot of people get when they get into the hobby and so they they misunderstand it so the way and you I, explain it makes perfect sense and i use the hook with most snakes as a no choice cue that does mean you're going to get picked up because most of the time i don't i don't go into their enclosures i don't force them to be touched or picked up but i don't heart need to mine just trust me they they find freedom reinforcing and i open the doors and they come out so, I, I mean, I rarely have to even go in and get one out. And I have 115 snakes here. I rarely have to take one out. But if I do, like we have a veterinary appointment or something, I use the hook as a no choice cue. That means I'm going to pick you up. And I use that when they're out, too. If they're out and they don't want to go back mm -hmm. and they're not shifting back, I'll use the hook and I'll touch them with it. And then they know I'm going to pick them up and put them back and they can't opt out of that. Like that's the one time they can't opt out. Otherwise they have the choice to opt out when I attempt to engage with them. All right. Well, that makes sense because there are just sometimes when for the continued well being of the snake, you do need to move them and there's, you can't wait for them to decide that it's time to move sometimes. Right. In certain situations. So along with handling, there's a, seems a lot uh, of others too. Um, handling in connection to eating. 
Can you talk about that as well? Yes. And I've talked extensively with my veterinarian about this. There is a misconception that if you handle your snake during feeding, it's going to regurgitate. Or if you handle it the day before, day after feeding, it's going to be stressed. If you handle it before feeding, it's going to be stressed and it won't eat. Or if you handle it after feeding, it's going to regurgitate. Regurgitation is a serious event. And it typically only happens in most species. There are a few species that regurgitate very easily, i.e. false water cobras, because they don't even swallow it all the way. And if they think something's going on, they regurgitate it and make sure they're safe and then they'll eat it again. It's pretty gross. <laughs> um, but most species <laughs> swallow their food and it regurgitation is very difficult and very costly energetically. So usually there's a medical condition or something going on that causes the regurgitation. If your snake is so distressed that the distress alone is causing regurgitation, there is a huge problem. And so if you stress out your snake, if your snake is stressed by you touching it or handling it, then it's going to be just as stressed if you touch and handle them when they've eaten. If my snake is not stressed by my presence or stressed by me touching it or handling it, it's not going to be stressed just because it ate now. So the issue is not is not when it ate. The issue is, is does your snake trust you and is it stressed out by you or not? Because when I take my snakes to the vet, we do positive reinforcement. Um, Dr. Pfaff's clinic is a fear-free certified practice, and she uses a lot of positive reinforcement, making the patients comfortable having the veterinary procedures. And so uh, we feed the snakes there during their medical exams and stuff. And then the snake's eating and Dr. Pfaff's examining them and listening to the heart. And it makes the snake associate that experience with positive emotional valence. Like they're not scared or fearful because something good happened to them at the vet. Or I'll, I'll uh, target the snake out of their carrier and onto a scale and I'll reinforce them. And then once they've eaten, we'll do the veterinary exam. Those snakes are habituated to that. It's not stressing them. They're used to it. We've trained for that at home. And so it isn't the meal. It's also not the location. It doesn't matter where the snake eats. It matters if the snake is stressed or not. Mm -hmm. So if the snake is not stressed by the bench or the couch or the coffee table, it's not going to be stressed there because you're feeding it now. Like it's not the food, it's the stress. And if you think about snakes in the wild and what they have to go through to acquire food, they have to leave their tree or their burrow or the soil or wherever they were. They have to travel. They have to locate and then acquire the prey. They have to eat it. Then they have to get back to their safe place. That's not easy sometimes. It means they have to traverse all kinds of different terrain. They might have to flee from wild animals on the way. Who knows what they have to do? But they're not just sitting in their tree or burrow and food is coming to them and, and there's no stress involved. Right. So, so that that's one of the misconceptions with reptile keepers that perplexes me. Because the snake's not going to be stressed by something just because it's eating if it's not stressed by that thing when it's not eating. Yeah, yeah I like that. That's a, a clear way to look at it. It makes a lot of sense. And I've noticed that because I... I, most of the snakes I keep are garters and they're communal. I have to <laughs> feed them. You know, I have to be very careful when I'm feeding them. And sometimes that means I remove a snake with my hand, feed the snake in my hand, wait for it to swallow and then put it back in the enclosure. And so I'm doing that all the time and I don't have problems with regurgitation. It, because they're used to it. They trust right. you. They're not fearful of you. It's not a big deal. If, if a dog's not eating treats during a training session, that's one of the red flags that the, the dog is so stressed that you don't need to be training it right now, or you don't need to have it in Home Depot right now or whatever, wherever you've taken the dog. If it's not taking treats, and same with the horse, because horses always want treats. If it's not taking the treat, it is stressed, and it's stressed by whatever's going on. So if the snake's not eating, it could not be eating because of stress. But that's not associated with the food. It's associated with you or the environment or what's happening. You need to look at the big picture of stress, not right. the food. Big picture, yeah. That's that's the key. Sorry, I just uh, 
I mean, I suppose, and this is maybe a caution with kids or maybe if, um, and and pets and animals are really good with people with uh, developmental disabilities. And I've worked a lot with them before, but with kids, especially be careful. I mean, like if the kid is squeezing the snake and it has food in it, I suppose that could cause some issues like regurgitation. So, you know, there's always going to be an exception where, okay, the kid squeezed the snake too hard or the snake was just so distressed. It, if the snake is in fear for its life at that moment, it may regurgitate. Right. But if the snake is in fear for its life and regurgitates, there's a bigger issue than the food. Exactly. It's, it's, there's, you need to remove the, the fear for its life before you worry about anything else. Yes. Whatever that happens to be. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and, what about feeding your snake when it's in shed? You know, if I haven't had any issues, like I have fed snakes in shed and that's one of those things again, that let it be the snake's decision. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to force or even try to feed a snake when it's in shed. But what has happened is I'm feeding other snakes around it. Like, and I think the snake can't see the target because it's in shed, but it will come out and clearly be watching me train the snake next to it. So then I'll go over and I'll show the target to the snake that's in shed and it will approach the target. I'm going to reinforce that with food. So Mm -hmm. if the snake's not reacting to environmental stimuli, I'm not going to open up the hide or get it down off the ledge or try to target it. But if it's engaging with what's going on around it, I'll give it, if it wants food, I'm going to give it food. If it doesn't want food, I'm not going to give it food, you know, Right. right. And sometimes sense. feeding a snake when it's in shed um, can like, especially if it's close to shedding anyway, will actually trigger it to shed more quickly. Well, I mean, it was about ready to shed and they eat, then you'll notice they'll shed that night or they'll shed the next day. Hmm. Okay. And, but it needs to be their choice. I don't hmm. ever force food. So if a snake's hiding, if they're not actively hunting, if they're not actively seeking food by demonstrating feeding behavior, then I don't even offer food. I wait to see that behavior from, and it needs to be species appropriate. So not all species are going to hunt in the same way. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and it's, it's interesting to see that the same snake in different situations and different stages of the shedding process will be interested in food or not. And, and that I've, I've noticed something very similar that sometimes the snake absolutely wants to eat. And it's very clear mm-hmm. uh, when it's in the shed process. And sometimes it's not interested in, anything it's just hunkering down and then i just leave it alone and- yeah i mean really we don't let the animals dictate their own behavior enough and it's super easy to care for them that way to let them dictate when they want to eat when they want to come out when they want to do what like just wait for them to tell you when they want stuff mm-hmm. unless it's an emergency obviously if there's some kind of life or death emergency then we do what we need to do but Right. That's not going to happen very often. And so just let the snake choose when it wants to interact with you, when it wants to come out, when it wants to eat. Let it tell you what it needs. Right. And that's that's the uh, seems the best way to build a relationship. If it is comfortable around you and is not feeling stressed around you, you're going to have the best sorts of interaction with it. And you can condition them like if you're using them for educational purposes. I have a few that are condition that let's say I know that I'm going to do an interview. I know I want to make a video. If I open the enclosures and set certain things up like ahead of time, they notice that and they'll come out because in the past that's meant that they get reinforced somehow. And so I'm not forcing them out, but I'm setting up the antecedent arrangement in such a way that I predict they probably will come out. And that's because they've associated those antecedents with positive things. So they, it's a low stress situation and it's a choice based situation for this. Right. Yeah, perfect. Let's see. There, are, there are so many excellent questions here and topics here. I don't know if we're and we're running out of time still, but I'm happy to come back and do a part two. It's no problem. I would love to do that because I think. Um, there's there's a lot we still need to cover you just need to keep track of what we've already covered and what we still need to cover yes i'll need to go through the the episode and and check things off and see what we did i like uh this uh 
this comment from questions earlier. I think she could do a whole Q&A stream on target training. We could easily. <laughs> so I'm doing a video series right now on, well, I have a few videos on step-by-step -step target training. One that just goes step-by-step, -step, here's how you do it. And then I have one specifically, if your snake is shy, step-by-step, -step, how to do it. And now I'm doing a serious short series on troubleshooting, like things that might come up when target training and how you troubleshoot through each of these things. But I'm happy to do a question and answer about it. Okay. Yeah. I think um, I think a lot of viewers and uh, myself included would be interested in doing both that and checking out your video series that you have. Um, that uh, being the case, everyone, please notice that here at the bottom of the video on the, the banner that's... Uh, at the bottom, we have her website, and this website is kind of a launch pad to go to all of her uh, social media, your, your YouTube channels on here, and your uh, Patreons on here, mm -hmm. and your Instagram, and that kind of thing. It's all, all here. Right. So you can easily get to that. And also, that webinar that I just finished is available through the IAABC Foundation. I think it's $35, and it's an on-demand webinar on snake enrichment. And it's two hours long and you get a certificate for that. And if you're a trainer or a behaviorist, I think the CEU approval is pending, but you should be able to get CEUs for that eventually. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so that's something to check out as well. Well, uh, our time is about up for today, but I am very interested in, in doing a part two in the future. And I wanted to thank you once again, Lori, for coming. Uh, I've learned a lot. and. Our viewers have learned a lot. So thank you for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us. You're welcome. I'm happy to do it. Okay. And uh, is there anything else you want to say in, in conclusion? We need more reptile veterinarians. <laughs> we need more reptile veterinarians. We need more reptile scientists as a whole, behaviorists, trainers, veterinarians, biologists. Um, one of the things in in reptile ownership that's challenging is to find an excellent exotic veterinarian and to find one in your area and to find emergency hospitals that will see snakes and other reptiles. I feel like there's, there's a shortage of veterinarians as a whole, and there's absolutely a shortage of exotic veterinarians. So if you're at all interested in that, I encourage you to pursue that education. We need more. Indeed. Indeed we do. I've had issues sometimes finding good uh, exotic vets. So I can attest to the truth of what you just said <laughs> from personal experience as well. So, well, um, I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. I know I did. And thank you again, Lori. And uh, we'll be in touch for uh, part two at some time in the future. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, everybody. And have a great night.